We've been travelling through Genesis, our, our new series. This is our fourth. Just talk amongst yourselves. Our fourth message in Genesis, and we're only up to Genesis 2. Uh, the reality is we could probably do a dozen just in Genesis 1 alone. But we are today up to uh, Genesis chapter 2, and we'll be looking through verses 1, 2, and 3. So if you have your Bibles with you, or your devices, would you please turn with me to Genesis chapter 2, and we will read together. (coughs) Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. Let's just pray. Father, this morning, as we come to your word We're so grateful, Father, that you have given us your word to help us to understand what it is you have done, are doing, and will do in salvation history. And Lord, as we look to our passage this morning, Lord, we confess our frailty and we confess that we come often with with veiled Uh, veiled thoughts and and understandings of your word. Help us, Father, for clarity today to understand the clear message of this passage. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Excuse me, I just have a little bit of a a dusty throat this morning. The book of Genesis, by its very nature... And its literary placement does introduce us to a great deal of primary and essential theology. But then it's crucial for us to get this theology right in order to understand the implications of the rest of Scripture. You've got to get this foundation stuff right. It would be very easy in coming to a passage like this to to head down endless rabbit trails. But our purpose this morning is to take up the challenge that sits very clearly within these three verses. That is to discover what God intended for us to understand in relation to this seventh day, this day of rest. Now, we know that that uh, (coughs) chapter and verse uh, divisions were not a part of the original Bible. They were something which was added to help mankind to put it into divisions and to to break it up. But without those, we can see that uh, this text is actually meant to be read in a natural flow uh, from those at the end of chapter 1. So, to give context to Genesis, uh, so to give context, Genesis 1.31 says, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. God had accomplished exactly what he had set out to do, and he was satisfied. In that moment, nothing existed in creation which was bad, which was corrupt or out of sync with God's plan and purposes. The heavens and earth were vast and they were teeming with life and they were exactly as God had intended them to be. God had completed his work of creation. The heavens and the earth and every aspect of God's great creation was finished. The creative process.
process was finished. And not only are we told it was finished, we also know that it was resting in a state of complete perfection. Verse 31 tells us, it was very good. And so these opening verses of chapter 2 are intended, I guess, as a a statement of conclusion or a summary statement to to the creation account. But they also serve as something of a a parenthesis or a, a segue between the completion of God's creative work to what we find uh, in the following chapters where we uh, get a more detailed account of God's creation. And, uh, of course, uh, his subsequent fall from grace through sin in chapter 3. Note here that it wasn't just the earth and sky which had been completed, but also all of the host of them. This term can include a wide range of things, but in this context, it includes everything which inhabits the now established earth and heavens, including all angelic beings. It's this detail that we dig into, which absolutely precludes any possibility for evolution. It wasn't made almost good. It wasn't partially complete. When God finished creation on day six, not only was everything complete, but it was perfect. King Solomon understood God's perfection also, and he wrote in Ecclesiastes, I know that everything God does will remain forever. There is nothing to add to it, and there is nothing to take from it. Let's look together at verse 2. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. God, being omnipotent and all-powerful, he didn't need to rest, as we understand rest on the seventh day. He didn't need to rest like us mere mortals. I do love a good rest, let me tell you. The older I get, the more I like it. And let me tell you, on a Sunday afternoon, there ain't nothing better than getting on my recliner and having a good rest. I think Bob understands this. So what are we talking about here? If we know from Scripture that God never slumbers nor sleeps and he never grows weary, why? Or what was actually intended here when Moses writes that God rested? That's an interesting word, rested. In the original language, it's sabbat. And of course, that's from where we get the word Sabbath. And it means to cease, to desist. Stop it. (laughs) And in this case, to cease and desist from creating. God rested for a number of reasons. The primary was to show, to demonstrate that his creation or his creative work was done, finished, perfect and complete. This was not an ongoing work. The second reason was that it gives a pattern to man regarding the structure of time. In seven day weeks, the seven day week is permanently ingrained within the the human mind. Although interestingly, Did you know that some through history actually tried to change the seven-day week? Good old France tried to make it decimal, and they tried a 10-day week, but that didn't last. But of course, those attempts came to nothing, and uh, we are on a seven-day cycle. Why? Because God is on a seven-day cycle, and we were made in his image. The third reason that God rested on the seventh day 
was to give an example of the blessing of rest. The blessing of rest on the seventh day of that cycle. Commentator uh, Boyce adds, God having completed his work of creation rests as if to say, this is the destiny of my people to rest as I rest, to rest in me. Sometimes we forget that God is not only infinitely wise, but have you noticed that God is also infinitely practical? He knows the frailty and the limitations of humanity. As our creator, God knows that it is good for man and for women and for little ones to get their rest off to bed early for you. Our bodies need it. Also, it's essential for our mental well-being to stop the daily tasks and, and commitments to rest our weary minds. We used to call it taking time to smell the roses. Take time to look about. But perhaps our greatest purpose in the Sabbath rest is that of our spiritual renewal. That coming to the well and drinking deeply Who here understands that the continual grind of a spiritually antagonistic world, it takes its toll on a spiritual believer's, a believer's spiritual life. Dave alluded to it earlier. It grinds you down day after day. We're bombarded with evolutionary thought and secular theory, along with philosophies of self-improvement. And ultimately, if I can be honest, self-deification. That is placing us at the epicenter of our own universe, making ourselves our own gods. And so the seventh day, having been sanctified or set apart as a special day of blessing, would become a reminder of two great truths. God alone was the active agent in creation for us today as we will soon see from the New Testament scriptures he was also the great God who was active in our redemption. Creation and redemption. So then the picture which is presented to us here is all of creation is absolutely perfect. And at rest. That's the picture which is presented to us here in chapter 2. Kind of sounds a little bit like heaven, doesn't it? Well, it kind of is. And after the fall of man, which we find in chapter 3, the rest of the whole Bible story is actually about God's continuing work of salvation, restoring us back into, and creation, into that place of perfection and rest. But there's an elephant in the room regarding this Sabbath. Sabbath. And the question that we need to deal with this morning is, are we under the obligation to keep the Sabbath day as laid out in the Ten Commandments, which we read in Exodus 20? Let's read it together. Exodus 20, verses 8 to 11. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall do no you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, or your livestock, or the sojourner, that's a visitor, who is within your gates. 
For on six days the Lord made heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the seventh day and made it holy. You may remember, unless you're new with us this morning, a few weeks ago, I was speaking uh, from a passage in Matthew 5, 17 through 20. And it was there that we discovered that Jesus had come not to abolish the Old Testament laws, but to fulfill those laws. And if you remember back to that message, we discovered that the entire law had been kept by Jesus. And therefore, he alone had fulfilled the law on our behalf, who by believing in Christ, by faith, are then deemed by his imputed keeping of the law to be law keepers, despite our brokenness and despite our sinful tendencies. Friends, this is what we call, well, it's the heart, I guess, of what we call the great transaction, whereby our sin was imputed to Jesus Christ on the, on the cross of Calvary, and so that by faith in his vicarious or substitutionary death, on our behalf, His righteousness or right standing before God is then imputed to us. Did you get that? He took our sinfulness and we got his righteousness. That's the great transaction. So then in the Sabbath, Do we see this then as something which believers in Jesus must observe as a statute from God today? We begin begin to to build a response to this question by, by looking at certain scriptures such as Paul's letter to Colossians. Now, it's good to know that this advice comes after Paul had been expounding uh, to these new believers who they were in Christ, all right? Who they were in Christ, speaking clearly of the new life that they had in Christ, having been buried through baptism in him, And made alive together with him through the resurrection. So from that context, Paul then says, Colossians 2, 16 and 17. Therefore, in the light of that, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. Of the Sabbath, he says, or of those things of which the Sabbath is included, Paul says, verse 17, these are a shadow of things to come. But the substance belongs to Christ. Notice here that Paul lumps the Sabbath in with food laws and festivals, new moons, all of which constitute shadows. They are anticipations of the coming of Christ. And so the clear inference here is that the keeping the, keeping the Sabbath day is no longer a matter of obedience or disobedience, but rather we're to give our attention to the essence of the command. What Paul called it, the substance. The substance. Paul says again in Galatians 4, 9 to 11, but now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how can you turn your back again to the weak 
and worthless elementary principles of the world whose slaves you want to be once more. You observe days and months and seasons and years. I'm afraid I've labored over you in vain. These passages make it clear, don't they, that that Christians are no longer under obligation to observe the Sabbath day. But because Jesus himself has fulfilled the purpose and plan of the Sabbath for us and in us. However, though we are free from the legal obligation of the Sabbath, We dare not ignore the importance, or as Paul called it, the substance of this day of rest. British Methodist theologian Adam Clark said of the Sabbath rest, God has built us so that we need one. Jesus himself said man wasn't made for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath was made for man. It's there for our benefit. But in being loosed from the legalism of keeping a specific day, Christians do not lose the Sabbath. Rather, every day should be a day of rest. But this isn't just any rest. This isn't the rest I was talking about before in my recliner chair. This is rest in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Every day is specially set apart to God. As believing Christians, we don't have secular and sacred days. We live every moment for his glory and our entire lives should be lives of worship and sacrifice. Paul in his letter to the Romans, Romans 12.1, I appeal to you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. That's not just Sunday morning. That's a lifestyle Paul's talking about. But did you notice that our Sabbath rest is actually obtained in Christ and appropriated because of his work? Let's look again at the New Testament, this time the Gospel of John, where Jesus himself has just healed a crippled man on the Sabbath and he's being absolutely berated by the scribes and the Pharisees. Uh, for, for doing it on the Sabbath. John 5 and 17. But Jesus answered them, my father is working until now and I am working. Yes, the work of creation had been completed, but the triune God, God Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit were all actively engaged in yet another work. This time, It was the work of redemption. That work too came to an end for Jesus when he cried out from the cross of Calvary, it is finished. And then he too rested in a tomb for three days until he was gloriously resurrected to a new life. Did you notice that the description of the six other days of creation ended with the phrase, and there was evening, and there was morning, the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth day. But this seventh, this blessed, this hallowed day of creation doesn't have that phrase attached to it. And this is because God's rest for us isn't confined to just one literal day. In Jesus, God has an eternal Sabbath rest for his people. Read Hebrews 9, uh, sorry, try again. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 9 to 11. 
So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. Let me pull this together in concluding. And that is, I want you to see something here. This this rest which is being offered. To whom is it being offered? To all and sundry? No. It's only available to the people of God. This rest is available only to those who are born again believers in Christ, trusting only in the finished work of Christ Jesus for their salvation. The only condition which precludes people or entry to this rest is, as we saw amongst those in the Exodus from Egypt, who, though they daily saw the majesty of God, And lived every day in the provision of God's grace. Were excluded from the promised land. Why? Because of their unbelief. Also see that this rest is God's rest. That we're being invited into. A rest that's only available when we too stop. Oh, friends, we've got to stop from our striving. Stop from, stop from our, our self-effort to achieve our own redemption. And you know what? Christians are not immune from that. Many who are saved still continue to try to earn points with God. <laughs> Brownie points. I'll do this and I'll do that. no. You know what that is? That's dead works. That's dead works. Matthew eleven twenty eight and 29. Dave uh, shared it this morning. What a, what a wonderful passage. What an incredibly comforting, beckoning passage. Come unto me. All who labor and are heavy laden. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. Come to me. Jesus makes it very clear here that this rest, this eternal peace that comes from God comes only through him. And of course, we read in Acts 4 and 12, Peter preaching on Pentecost. He says, there is salvation in no one else. Don't look elsewhere. For there is no other name so given amongst men by which we must be saved. Come to me. This invitation to take up his yoke It's an invitation to join with him, to link step, to be in personal relationship with him. When two oxen are yoked together, they walk as one. They walk in the same direction. They pull an equal load. They cooperate. Satan would have you rest even while you're working. Jesus wants you to rest. Did I say that wrong? Satan wants you to work even while you're resting. Jesus wants you to rest while you're working. Something like that. You work it out.
It's here in the midst of this Christ-saturated resting and working that we live out the Sabbath day. Christ-saturated working, Christ-saturated living, Christ-saturated resting. If the Sabbath is for us to remember, to rest, to worship the God of both creation and redemption, then perhaps there is no more fitting way for us to do that as a body of believers than this morning to share in communion together. You have your little cups. If you don't have one this morning, if you forgot it, if you're new this morning, we've got some deacons who will come around. Just slide your hand up and they will give you a little communion cup. Go ahead and take that top layer off. Here, as we take the bread and as we take the juice, which represents for us this morning Jesus' body, which was broken for our well-being. The blood is represented by this juice, the blood which was shed for the remission of our sins. And we do so this morning as a memorial. We do it in gratitude to the Lord Jesus Christ that we may now come into a place of rest, a place of grace. There is a place of quiet rest, where? Near to the heart of God. And so this morning we do remember that Christ himself worked the works of both creation and redemption on our behalf. We know that we can rest in him because he cried out with his final breath, it is Finished. And so now we also can cease from our strivings and our works and simply by faith receive full forgiveness for our sinfulness and for our unbelief. Let me pray and then we can worship the Lord as we take the elements together. Let's our loving God and our Father, we thank you for the cross. We thank you that you saw in frail humanity the inability to become righteous. And so you set out to make a way, a way of redemption. Thank you that this was a mission of love and a mission of mercy, one which was beyond any of our own ability. And so, Lord Jesus, you came and you gave of yourself on our behalf to bring us back into that living and loving relationship with God our Father. And so we thank you. Thank you, Father, this morning for Jesus' body broken and for his poured out blood, the only sacrifice for sin that we too may know that blessed rest as we take with grateful hearts this morning these elements in Jesus' name.